first of all, thanks to the organizer for inviting me. I have to uh, prevent, before to start, about two things. Uh, first of all, about my English. So, um, as, as you know, I'm from Uruguay and my English is not so good. Uh, so, uh, be aware of that, okay? And please interrupt me if, if I make uh, some mistakes that for sure I would make. The second thing is that for a tech problem, uh, I received the information about this seminar just two days ago. And, and also, uh, I have my flight in one hour in the, in, I have to be in the airport in one hour. So uh, all of these things makes me change the presentation uh, three times. And one time more when uh, Andrew <laughs> pushed me to present the data that I already present, some part of the data that I already present in the seminar that we have been uh, the last two days. So. Uh, please uh, be patient with me because maybe there are some mess in the presentation and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, what I would like to present here is uh, part of the work that we are doing in Uruguay um, through the Plan Ceibal. That is something that I'm going to present now. Uh, my, my talk would have mainly three parts. In, in, in the first part, I will present Plan Ceibal, uh, which is a very interesting initiative that we have in Uruguay, the One Laptop Per Child program, implemented 100%. Also, I have to introduce you in a, in a concept that maybe many of you knows, but maybe some others not. That is approximate number system. It's a concept that we are using uh, to train children in something that it seems to prepare them to learn math. So I, I have to tell some things about it just to understand the intervention. That is the second part of my talk. I will present an intervention with tablets and 500 children that we made in 2013 and some of the results that we are obtaining from this uh, intervention. And in the last part, uh, I'm not going to present the other study that I present in the seminar in two, that we performed in 2014, but I will tell you some ideas that we are going to develop this year about how we can go outside of the screen and how we can involve teachers in the intervention more um, properly. Let's say, uh, how to have teachers more engaged in the interventions that we have. And for this reason, we are trying to convert tablets and laptops in something that uh, is not necessary to be attached to. Okay? So th this is a new thing that I'm going to present and try to um, connect with STEM learning, okay? Uh, these are typical images of Uruguay today, and I think are very nice images. I, uh, even the last one, because it shows that technology is arriving to everywhere in the country. It's also true, like my friend Antonio Batro usually says, that when we show these kind of pictures in Europe, uh, kids usually says that they want the horses. <laughs> but it's not the case here in, in, in South America. And, and it's really important to know that this program uh, has initially two main objectives. The, the main objective that the program, One Laptop Per Child, Seibal program is the name in Uruguay, uh, has proposed was to increase social e equity in the access to technology. And of course, this goal is already achieved, okay? The second goal that they uh, proposed in 2007 when they start as, initial, as, as a presidential initiative of the President Vasquez uh, was to um, produce knowledge and get involved in new ideas. They have the idea that if you have all the children connected and all education system involved with technology, maybe it's more easy to appropriate and produce knowledge and get involved with new ideas. And it's also true that this objective uh, was not achieved so early, let's say. And, and I have to say that uh, it's a good thing to say that this year the Plan Ceibal opened a center of research, especially uh, dedicated to these kind of things that we started doing two years ago. But, but it's, it's a good thing to know that they are starting doing research specifically with the access of technology uh, in education system. However, uh, in, 2000, in 2009, 
we can say that uh, in Uruguay, every child in the public system, in the public education system, has his own laptop in a daily basis uh, manner. I mean, uh, the laptop is not from the school. The laptop is of each, uh, from each uh, child that is going to, to the houses, okay? Uh, it's, it's a part of them. It's, it's not a school. It doesn't belong to the school. But in 2013, they start to introduce tablets. And they, they said something like, okay, we, we, we have to move forward. Let's try to introduce 10,000 tablets in the country and see what happens because maybe tablets are more usable, especially for, uh, for small kids, for, for little kids, like six years old. When they do that, we realize that maybe it was an opportunity to make research uh, with that. And we connect this with something that we are organizing in South America uh, that, that calls the LA School, the Latin American School of Education and, Neural, and Cognition and Neural Science, where Andrew was uh, faculty, and also uh, we have the privilege, the privilege to be in the steering committee right now. Um, in 2013, it was organized by Siddhartha Rivero, uh, who is a professor here in Rio Grande do Sul, and we were invited, and we realized there, talking with Liz Spelke, who, who collaborated with us in these kind of interventions, that we could make some interventions promoting, um, the, preparing the kids better to math if we use the tablets. So we, we came back to Uruguay, and we asked the president of Plan Seval, Miguel Breschner, if he let us try one crazy idea that we have at that time, that it was something like, okay, uh, le let me introduce first one concept to understand the idea. Um, what about if I told you, if I ask you how many people are in this room, in the room of the picture, not, not here? Uh, some of you think that maybe 15 or 18 or 20, no? Uh, some of you think that maybe here there are 200 people. How, how do you do that? Do you count that? Do you count them? If you look at this auditorium, do you know how many uh, we can be here? How do you know that? If you realize we have a very accurate sense of number, very accurate approximate number system, uh, maybe many of you would say something around 50 or 60 people for that picture, and, it, and it's exactly 63, because I, I count them. <laughs> uh, and this is very surprising, because how do we do that? Of course, this came from perception, and, and, and it's true that maybe this is some kind of precursor of math ability, because it's related with what we are going to use afterwards in symbolic manner with numbers. And in fact, there are some research of Elizabeth Brannon and also from Elizabeth Spelke in Harvard that show that children at six months are able to distinguish between eight and 16, eight and 16 uh, dots in, in the screens just with six months. Not, not telling you that there are 16, but uh, show, uh, looking at the screen that change between this uh, quantity of dots more time than the one that doesn't change in the quantity, okay? So I didn't bring the video to show that experiment, but if you look in internet, you will see that it works. So it seems that if we train children with this kind of task, not the one that how many people are in the room, but this kind of task, of task, task where I can ask you if there were more blue dots or more yellow dots. How many of you think that there, there were more yellow dots there? You are okay in math, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so if we train children at six years old with this kind of task, task maybe uh, we can obtain better results in math. And this was the central hypothesis that we uh, suggest to Seibal um, authorities to test in the real world, okay? So we went through this evidence to 
10 schools in Montevideo. We took 30 classes of uh, around 20, 24 children. That is the size of the classes in, in, Mont in Montevideo. And we performed 10 sessions of approximate 40 minutes twice a week during five weeks. Okay? With children inside the class. And the teacher was looking at us. And, and you will see right now how do they look at us. We, we have at the end, because some of the data were loose, uh, around 500 kids, data from 500 kids of four different levels of socioeconomic status. Because in Uruguay also we have um, categorized the socioeconomic status of each school. Okay? And then in the picture, you can see the colors that depends on the quint quintile of uh, socioeconomic um, status, let's say. Okay? What we have done, we perform a classical design of pre-test and post-test measure, and we make an intervention in the middle. And for the pre-test measures, we measure many things. But I, I'm going to concentrate here just in two uh, measures that we use. One of them was a math test that we call PUMA, Prueba Uruguaya de Matemáticas, okay? uh, that we developed exactly for this research, but it's very similar to Thema 3. It's, it's a standard test that we use, well, that uh, in the United States and many countries use for evaluate math in, in, in children. Okay? Uh, just to have a flavor of that, the math test is, a, is more or less like this. Let me show you some of the screens so you can have an idea. Uh, the exercises are of composing number and decomposing numbers, uh, and the kids have to answer with the finger uh, the correct answer of each uh, task, task. Okay. All the kids have their own uh, headphones, and they receive the instructions by our applicants, and also for the, for the software that repeat the instructions to them just before to start the, the, the task, okay? Also, we decided to measure time discrimination. And this was before, uh, <laughs> this was because um, my child, when, when he was four years old, makes me think that these kind of things are very related. And, and in fact, they are related. And, and after reading the literature, you would find that uh, Vincent, Vincent Walsh in 2003 already suggests that we have a, a unique system of magnitude where we compute time, space, number, and all that magnitudes that we manage uh, all day. Uh, the, the story with my children, with my child, was very uh, clever for me because he, he's, he told me something like, uh, I was working at the computer, and he said, Dad, let's go to play soccer. And I said, okay, give me five minutes, because I have to finish this. And he said, I know how much is five minutes. I said, how much is five minutes? And he said, five minutes is counting until 200. How do you know that? And he said, well, the other day I was with Grandma, and Grandma told me, uh, wait me here for five minutes. And I don't know what to do, you know, so I start counting. And when I arrived 200, grandma arrives. So five minutes is 200. And of course, I'm his dad. So <laughs> I have to say that that's a brilliant reasoning. But also shows us that in the brain of children, these kind of things are all together and grow together. And maybe this is, and, and we have data that shows that, that, but I'm not going to show that here, uh, that time discrimination is a way of uh, adjust our knowledge of math in, in these early stages of life, okay? So we perform this, um, this game that it was very famous between, uh, among the children. Uh, if I have audio? <laughs> the, the children have to answer which is the monster that is burping more, for more time, okay? So, it's, it's a classical time discrimination task. They, they don't have just burping because the teachers were just scared of us when, when we show this kind of, um, uh, of task. Of task. But uh, th this game was very funny for the kids, and the kids uh, were uh, in love with that kind of, of game. 
just I, I, I can't believe that maybe it's not just for the burp uh, stuff, also because the monster were very funny and, and all that stuff. So we measure through this ta task the time discrimination performance of the children also. We measure many other things, but I'm going to show you just data of these two things, so I'm not going to tell you all the details of the other things that we measure. The, the intervention was based on the task that I showed you before. Uh, it was developed by Justin Halberda in, in John Hopkins University, who was a collaborator in this research with us. And in this task that we use for training for four days, kids have to sign out with the finger which is the box that has more dots. Okay? And it's very quickly. Uh, so you have, to, you have to answer all the time, like, but just looking at, you cannot count in because of the time that you have the information on the screen. Okay? Okay. So during five weeks, this was more or less, more or less our life. We've been at the schools twice a week for 40 minutes, and we performed three days of pre-test measures, four days of intervention with a Panama task, with this task, this task of dots, and also after that, we measures the same, the same that we measured at, at the pretest. Okay. Let me show you some of the results. Uh, do you remember that we have four levels of socioeconomic status? Okay. So we, we use that as an independent variable, and we put the data, for example, of math performance, the outcome of the of the Puma test uh, against the socioeconomic status. And the bad news is that for pre-test measures, we obtain the typical pattern that uh, everybody who is working in that kind of things know that socioeconomic status make like an exponential curve with cognitive performance in, in any area that, that, that you measure. In math also, it has, okay? So if you are from a very favorable context, you are going to be better in math that if you are from a very adverse context, okay? And this is true everywhere. But the good news is that our intervention seems to change this pattern. First of all, it shows that, this have a pointer? Okay. Um, it shows that we obtain gains for math performance in, four, in the four levels of socioeconomic status. But the most important thing is that it seems that our intervention changed the pattern. We have to be aware also that it seems that the major changes are for the middle context and not for the lowest and not for the, for the best one. But of course, uh, this is also a typical result in these kind of interventions. It's very hard to, uh, to provoke that the lowest level get higher. Okay, and also it's, it's very hard to move the ones that are okay. We obtain the same pattern for time discrimination, and, and this is another reason why we think that the intervention is the responsible of changing the pattern of the curve. Okay, and, and this is one of the things that we are exploring more because if it's, if it's true, uh, probably it's a good manner of implement uh, policies that provoke that the typical pattern in Uruguay, maybe in some years, would be like that, and not like that, okay? Uh, we also want to see who was the one who gains more for the intervention, okay? So we split data in uh, low level in math at initial, um, in the pretest measure, and high level in math in the pretest measures. And of course, we obtained that the major gain was for those who are not very good in math at the initial level. But more interestingly, if we divide the high level in math against the uh, socioeconomic status, we will notice that the major effects are not in the, in the favorable uh, context of the high level in math. The bigger effects, effects are in the low level says, but 
very good in math. And this is something that we want to explore more, but I, I'm convinced that the intervention had to be adjusted to, uh, to a specific target. And this is something that we can discuss after, because it's, it's not true that you can make an intervention for everyone. You know? So you have to plan, and of course this was not planned for that, uh, your intervention for that target, or that target, or that problem, okay? However, uh, so, okay, some preliminary conclusions until here. Uh, it seems that ANS, approximate number system, and symbolic math are related, and this raises the possibility that this type of intervention may be benef beneficial for less competent kids, and also for high competent kids from low level sets, okay? However, it's also true that teachers were not very much involved in this study. And this is something that we obtained after we finished the study. We visit all the teachers that were involved, the 30 teachers responsible of the classes, and have an interview with them, showing the results, and also asking them what do they think about the intervention. And most of them tell something like, oh, I really like the intervention, and I, and I noticed that my children are more engaged with math. But the problem is that I need that you come next year here to do the same. Are you going to come? And of course, the answer is not. Because we don't have, we, we are not policy makers, <laughs> that's for sure. And also, we don't have the, the means to do this all the time. So we realize that somehow we have to design something that teachers could perform. And it's also true that these kind of things, even in Uruguay, where you have tablets since 2009, are very far away from the teachers, from the normal teachers. Because normal teachers doesn't feel very attached to technology. So many times during the intervention, the teacher says something like, oh, uh, can you come to our applicants, to our students? Because it doesn't work. So she is far away from the intervention, from the, from the typical things of the intervention. So we realize there that there is a problem. Also, and this is more focused with, with uh, what we are studying now in STEM, we notice that we were in prison of the screens. I mean, kids were doing many things with the screens, but they could, knew, they could not do nothing with the hands Manip manipulating objects. Because we are in the tablets, we don't have yet uh, a manner to measure these kind of things. And of course, this is uh, very far away of what we are looking for. Because we know that most of our children interactions with technology are restricted to the screen, but this is not the best way of learn. Okay? So, we are looking for a manner to measure manipulations of objects also with technology, but without being attached to technology. And th this, is a, this is a great challenge that I, I will try to convince you that is possible, and I will try to show you at the end what we are thinking to do. The thing is that at that point in 2014, for the intervention that we uh, performed there, we realize that we have to try to go out of the screens, maybe losing some data, but still maintain some measures to see if the intervention works or not. So we went to a, big, a, a small scale study. We went to a school in, in Punta del Este, a very low level school, even, even, it, even if it is in Punta del Este, there are low level schools there, believe me. Uh, and we suggest to use cards instead of tablets. So we propose to the principal of the school to make an intervention very similar to the one that I told you, but with cards, with these kind of cards. This is the front of the card, and this is the back of the card. We introduce here another thing that it seems to work properly. In the tablets, the kids just have the dots. In the cards, we put the dots, and also we put the numbers in the back of the cards. And the, the, 
the kids have to play this. Okay, there are many details of the design that I'm going to skip now. We, we, we perform many tasks, no, no, not just the one of comparison. We also uh, test and another task that, that it was addition. But just to have a flavor of, of how does it work, the kids was, were, work, were playing in the class, in tables, putting the cards in the mesh that, that it corresponds to the color that have more. So if you have more blue dots, you have to put the cards here. If you have more red dots, you have to put the card here. Okay? But the interesting part, and look this, look this child here. He's not looking at the dots. He's looking at the numbers. You see? Uh, here they are looking at the, at the dots. But there, if you, I don't know if, if you can see here. Uh, let me show ver, you again. Priscila, ¿qué te parece que tiene más esa, rojo o azul? ¿Qué tiene? I can. Look that, that guy here. He's always looking at the numbers, you know? And even if you think that maybe this is not fair or whatever, this is very important for kids because kids at that age, they have six years old and we are like in July or whatever, so half of the year. They don't know exactly the, rela the, the relationship between numbers. I mean, it's not easy for a kid to know that 14 is so, it's bigger than 11, for example. So he's using this, and this seems to be the key that for why we obtain better results in this intervention than in the other one. But we don't know yet this. We have two hypotheses about that. I'm not going to, to show you here the results of this because I, I will uh, lose all my time and I want to show you the thing that we are thinking for next year. Uh, but the thing is that in this intervention, we introduced two different things. One was the cards in itself that provokes that teachers were more involved with the game because teachers are the ones that make the intervention because they feel very comfortable with the cards. So they... they if you, if you listen at the other video, you, you will hear the teacher explain the game or whatever, okay? And the second difference was that we introduced the numbers in the back of the cards. We could do that anyway with uh, tablets. The thing that we cannot do is to, uh, to be able to manage the cards, to manipulate the cards, okay? Anyway, what we are thinking now? Well, we are thinking in go away from the tablets, but still have the possibility of measure what the kids are doing. And of course, the uh, initial idea of that is uh, filming the kids and then codify what they are doing, okay? But this is a mess. I mean, if you are thinking in intervention of 1,000 or something like that, you cannot be prepared for that. I mean, it's impossible to uh, analyze the videos of 30 classes in three weeks of intervention, uh, trying to codify each of the actions of each children. There is a solution? Well, it seems to be a solution, but just for iPads right now, and it's not very oriented to education. So our intention is to uh, convince Plan Saibal and national um, Agency of Research and Innovation in Uruguay to give money to this project that I'm going to present to you now. We call CETA, and the project is to transform, transform tablets into a tangible, tangible interaction in the closed area device. How does it work? Well, the idea is to have some kind of device that you can put on the tablet, like a mirror, that generates an area in the table, on the table, where you can play, but you are not filming this. You are recognizing this by a software of vision computer. Okay? So if you have this possibility and you make it open source, we expect that many teachers and te techno people, let's say software development or whatever, developers or whatever, uh, make 
different applications for educations to use. But just to have an example of the things that we can do with this kind of device, we are proposing to make some games oriented to work hand for the eye coordination. And I will show you an example in, in a minute. And also, we want to perform cognitive evaluation. Psychologists used to use uh, manipulating of objects for evaluate, like in the WISC test or WISE test. Do you, remember, do you know, like, uh, how do you call this in English? The cube test, the, the cube soup test or whatever? OK, so with these kind of devices, we could evaluate in psychological tests that use manipulation of objects, but automatically. So you can measure what the children are doing and know if they are doing properly or not, but you don't need to have a person with one person all the time. That makes impossible to make uh, big interventions. So some of the games and tasks that we are uh, proposed to implement are the Tangram-like. This is a typical game that is also implemented in the, in the commercial version of the, of the device. Also, we are thinking in some seriality uh, games where kids have to, for example, move this in order to complete the sequence, but move in real manner, let's say. And also, we are thinking, keep in mind that tablets in Uruguay are using these kind of tablets, not the iPads, are using for low-level CES kids who never uh, have in mind to have a Wii, for example. But this kind of device can convert the table, the table, the tablet, <laughs> In, in some kind of we. Because if you, if you make like this to the mirror, the area that you have on the table will be here in the space. So we are thinking in some kind of game of, you know, uh, moving your hands to put balls that are on the screen, moving around or something like that, where we can measure uh, eye coordination, motor coordination or whatever, okay? Of course, the software that we are planning to develop have to uh, save all the data in a proper manner. That commercial versions doesn't do that because they, they don't care, because they are not oriented to research. And this is a big difference. Anyway, just to uh, give you a brief uh, outline of our plan, uh, we are moving from, or we start moving from social equity to research on cognitive stimulation through tablets uh, during the time of 2013 to 2015, let's say. And right now, we are trying to move from cognitive stimulation through tablets to involve teachers in the interventions and measure the manipulative, manipulative abilities of children. So I can imagine not far in the time that classes in Uruguay could be more or less like this. Just to have a flavor of how does it work, we start using these kind of devices in clinical, um, in clinical context. If you can hear and understand Spanish, and this is very similar to what you show, Andrew, uh, about the, the kid using language as a mediator. Perfecto. If you listen. Abajo. Abajo, he said. Arriba. Arriba. He's trying to order the mind through the language. You know? This is very similar to what you show when, when the kid was singing about, I have to wait, I have to wait, I have to wait. Okay. He's trying to, okay, this is uh, down, this is up, you know? And also, there is another nice example that we discover. This kid has dyslexia, di dyslexia, how do you pronounce that? Dyslexia, okay. And uh, if you look, I don't know if, if, if you can see there, uh, he is going to, uh, yeah, he switched the colors. You know it's He switched the colors. And he didn't realize, he didn't realize. But the software, of course, doesn't uh, give the feedback, the positive feedback, because the colors are mixed. So the teacher is saying, are you sure the colors is like this? And then he realized, okay? These are the kind of things that we can perform in Uruguay in the next years, I hope. 
So, we hope that Zeta will give us the possibility to measure new things as, a as a spatial ability, spatial abilities. <laughs> <laughs> we had this conversation yesterday. Uh, in children and correlate these type of measures with typical cognitive measurement. These kind of devices could extend even more the huge possibilities of research in, in school using hands-on games. For example, as a possible tool for invisible evaluation because we could make games for children and doing evaluation at the same time and they wouldn't be realized that they are being evaluated, let's say. Also, we expect that Zeta, as an open source tool, could motivate the software community to develop apps that greatly increase intervention opportunities related to present STEM. Thanks a lot.